All right, everyone. We're off to the races. Good morning. Happy Saturday. We are thrilled to pieces to have you here today. Um, this is a new series that we're starting. It's our Road to Rowan SOM. No one better to start it with than our Dean of Curriculum, Dr. Millicent Chanel, to tell us a little about the um, the curriculum choices, her road to medical school. Lots of great tidbits and info to share with us today. We also have Dean Watkins here to give a quick welcome and thank everybody for being here. Um, like I said, we're completely overjoyed to have you all here today. We have a lot of great info to go through. I'm going to keep a really close eye on the chat. So as questions pop up, if I have to pop in and do share anything with Dr. Chanel, I'll be happy to. But let me just open the floor up for Dean Watkins to say hello um, and welcome you all here for this first part in our in our long winded series throughout the semester. Thanks, John. Really appreciate the, that introduction. And thank you so much, Dr. Chanel, for your time this Saturday. And for all of you who've joined us, we're really excited about this series. You know, it's an opportunity to really connect with our faculty administration, ask questions that you may have as you're about to embark on this amazing journey here at Rowan SOM. So we're really excited to um, provide this information to you. I wanna also welcome you on behalf of our Dean, Dr. Thomas Cavalieri, who's really excited about, you know, your admission and all the great things that are to come as you begin your, your journey to medical school. So I'll turn this back over to John. Thank you again so much, John, for the work that you've put together, put into this program. Happy to do it. I think it's going to be super beneficial. All right. So now the woman of the hour, Dr. Millicent Chanel here. Um, Dr. Chanel has a slide deck to go through and tell you a little bit about the curriculum options and the great work that we do with our student doctors at Rowan SOM and tell us a little bit more about her journey. Without further ado, Dr. Chanel. Thank you, John. Thank you, Paula. I appreciate it. We're so happy to be talking to you on this Saturday <clears throat> afternoon for most of you for uh, probably Saturday morning for a couple of you who are out of the time zone. Um, but we appreciate your time. I thought I would start just by telling you a little bit more about myself and my own journey to medicine, um, only to just to give you some context of how I view the journey that you're about to start and maybe see if there's some commonalities of what you've experienced and how you're making your decisions. And some of you are still trying to decide about PBL versus SGL as you're moving forward. So one of the things that I would say um, is I started off, I well, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, uh, for all the Brooklynites out there. And I didn't know that I wanted to go to medical school because at the time I had only been exposed to MD schools and allopathic programs. Uh, and it really just didn't gel. Um, I, all the shadowing I did seemed like it was really just sort of medications and um, surgeries and just seemed uh, a bit cold to me um, and not necessarily as focused on preventative medicine as I would have liked. And it was actually a friend of mine from Barnard College where I went to undergrad who, she was actually in chiropractic school, weird enough. Um, and she was trying to convince me to become a chiropractor. And she said, this is how it's different from osteopathic medicine. And this is how it's different from allopathic medicine. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa rewind. What's that osteopathic medicine thing that you're talking about? And she really sent me on a journey looking at osteopathic medicine because it wasn't that I was against Western medicine. If I'm having a heart attack, I wanna to go to a cath lab. If I have an appendicitis, I wanna go uh, get surgery. Um, but I really wanted something that was broader and more holistic and more encompassing. Um, and so I didn't just wanna do um, you know, dietary changes and I didn't just wanna do oils or things like that. And I also just didn't wanna do pharmaceuticals and surgeries. I wanted something that was broader. And so the osteopathic philosophy really, really spoke to me about that. And for some of you who may even still be trying to like on the fence about us versus another school, what I would say to you is you should look at the mission of each school that you're looking at and say which one resonates with you. Um, medical school is hard no matter where you go and it's a different level of hard than most students have experienced before. And so you want the hard to be in the volume of work and then and the sort of the stamina part not in the cultural differences or the long-term goals of who that school aspires to help you become. So that you shouldn't feel like as a person, you are swimming upstream against your own character or values. You fe should feel like the school is helping to propel you and who you're becoming as a person, because that's who you're gonna be as a physician and what you're gonna bring back to the communities that you serve. And so again, medical school is hard no matter where you go. It's the right kind of hard, 
right? We want the kind of heart that's challenging, that's pushing us to be the best versions of ourselves, um, but that the best versions of ourselves are in sync with what that school's vision is and what that school's mission is. Um, and, and that's really what I hope that you'll pay attention to. So if you look at our mission uh, about becoming culturally competent leaders and about service, um, then please, please, you know, you're in the right place. If you look at that and that just doesn't quite feel like it fits for you, then I hope that you'll explore other places that are more in sync uh, with who you are, because we all wanna be sort of rowing in the same direction. We all wanna be moving in the same direction uh, as a school. So for me, when I was applying, um, I'm a Brooklyn girl, I needed to be uh, in a city, near a city, you know, uh, no shade, no disrespect to rural places where many of our schools are, um, but I needed to be in a place that was had a little bit more hustle and bustle. Um, and so I went to PCOM because I needed to be in a city. I didn't even drive till I was 25. Uh, and I had to learn how to drive to go on rotations uh, for clerkships. Um, and I wish I had known more about Stratford, but when I was coming from Brooklyn, I was like, ah, Jersey, ah, suburbs, ah, I don't drive. I don't know what to do with that. Um, and so, um, you know, I, it probably would have been a, a better fit for me, uh, but I just didn't hadn't really explored that in enough detail to understand that difference. Um, and what I love when I was coming out of medical school and applying for residencies, I had, I was going into family medicine. I'm a family medicine doc by training, and I have a fellowship in osteopathic uh, manipulative medicine uh, on top of that. But when I was applying for family medicine programs, I had so many people telling me that I had to go check out this place. It was at the time it was called UMDNJ. I had to go across the river and check out this place called UMDNJ because of how strong the residency was. Um, and then after I did my residency here, I joined the faculty. And I really did not enter medical school thinking I was going to go into academic medicine, but I had gotten my master's in secondary science education before I came to medical school. And when my residency director asked me what I was gonna do when I was done our family medicine training, I said, oh, I'm gonna do a fellowship in manipulation. And he said, oh, have you ever thought about academics? And I said, no, um, but I do love teaching. And it just stuck. I mean, I, it was just like, you know, round peg, round hole. It was just, just a perfect fit um, for me. And because Rowan's mission is the same as my heartfelt mission, it was again, an easy fit for me. Um, so when I was brought on, I, I've held probably every role in the school that you can think of. I've been general faculty, I've been a course director, a clerkship director, a residency director, an academic department chair, uh, and now I'm the associate dean for curriculum. And when I was hired uh, and took on the role of being curriculum dean, I was asked to <clears throat> help lead a curriculum renewal, which we implemented in the fall of 2019. And we have some amazing and outstanding and dedicated faculty. And we really took on that role of saying, what does the clinical climate look like? And how can we best support the kinds of students that we recruit? Because although all of our students are academically gifted, all of our students also bring a lot of service, a lot of leadership, um, and just a lot of really powerful, diverse stories uh, to the school. And so how can we best incorporate that? And for some of them, they've taken some non-traditional routes and haven't necessarily come straight from undergrad. And so for some students, uh, or some students weren't even science majors, they were English majors or other things. Um, and maybe they just kind of have to really ramp back up uh, to get back into the swing of things and the intensity of what medical school is. So how can we best support that? And we spent three years uh, developing that process, trying to get to that. Um, and I think that that's reflected in multiple parts of the new curriculum. And I, I don't know when I have to stop calling it new because it's been several years now. Uh, but we spent several years trying to look at programs across the country and even some globally about what were best practices and what would fit our school in South Jersey, uh, a place that in itself is quite diverse in so much as the campus itself is in a suburban area. The 30 miles in any direction uh, in from where we are is Philadelphia or farmland or beaches or, I mean, really all the different kinds of places that you can live. You can live rural, uh, fairly close to the school and you can be in the heart of a major city, 30 minutes from the school. Um, and so we pull from all of those places uh, for our student body. 
And so how can we serve all of those different backgrounds and really help them to integrate uh, in a powerful way? So I'm gonna pull up a couple of slides uh, that I hope will address some of the questions that you guys shared uh, previously. And then we'll see if you have any other questions that come up for you uh, as we uh, move through. And I'm sorry, this little banner doesn't want to move out of the way so I can hit the slide deck. Uh, doo -doo. Doo -doo -doo -doo. There we go. All right. So in medicine, we called our curriculum the Tensegrity Curriculum because everybody thinks of med medical school as being really hard and really challenging and really focused on the medicine part. And medical knowledge is really, really important, obviously. But I always chant to students, we are training physicians, not technicians. And many of our applicants, either themselves or their family members, have had encounters with the medical profession that were not as positive as they wanted them to be. And that probably had very little to do with the actual medical information that was being conveyed or the diagnosis that was being conveyed. It probably had more to do with how it was communicated, how you felt like you were treated, whether or not your autonomy and your agency was being recognized and you were being incorporated into the decision process. It probably had to do more with access uh, and how, how easy it was to navigate the medical system. All of those things go into you becoming a great physician to guide your patients through all of that, those parts and to bring all of those parts to the table as a physician. And all of those things go into patients having a great experience and having a great outcome. And so the concept of tensegrity, tensegrity is the combination of the words tension and integrity. Uh, it's used in architectural terms and it's used in the osteopathic community to talk about our body and our systems and how we move through the world because it's a balance of tensions of muscles and bones and fascia that allows us to move upright through the world. It's all about a balance of forces. And so we said it's the tensegrity curriculum of balancing medical knowledge, communication, professionalism, uh, understanding the systems that you work in and, and the processes that our patients go through, understanding how to improve yourself through practice-based learning and improvement. All of these competencies as physicians, not technicians, come into play to make a great doctor. And so that's why we named it the Tensegrity Curriculum. It was sort of unanimous, particularly amongst our upperclassmen who were familiar with the term. And they said, that's exactly what we're going for. And that's what we want to call it. Let's see if this will let me pro progress. So that's what we're looking at. We're talking about balancing all of these parts. Obviously, the medical knowledge is important, but if you have poor communication skills, if you can't empathize with your patient, if you can't read the room and understanding what's not being verbally communicated and really anticipate that and integrate that into your care, you're not going to be as accomplished in terms of patient outcomes as you might hope. Uh, you might get the right diagnosis, but if they don't follow your treatment plan because they don't trust you, that's a problem too. And so we're really trying to balance all of those components as we train you to become physicians. So in our curriculum, we have two tracks. We have the synergistic guided learning, which is more of the traditional track and more lecture-based, and we have the problem-based learning track. Um, both tracks have undergone a curriculum renewal process. Our osteopathic clinical skills, or OCS, is where you learn history and physical diagnosis, osteopathic structural exam and treatment, and procedures. We try to coordinate which systems you're learning about with whatever blocks you're in. And since the SGL and PBL tracks don't go in the same order of their blocks, the OCS uh, courses have to be separated so that they can synchronize with the blocks that each track is in. But both tracks come together to be in the year-long longitudinal courses of medical scholarship and community service learning and leadership. And both tracks come together for our intercessions and our bridge weeks. So one of the questions that came up was, what does a typical week look like? And so we cap out our weeks on average for the SGL curriculum at 22 hours a week. Um, 
And on average, it actually comes out to about 15 hours a week because during exam weeks, you probably have a lot fewer hours, more like eight. And sometimes in some classes like anatomy, when there's labs, uh, you might have more like 25 hours uh, a week uh, for those labs that, that take place during anatomy. But on average, we cap out at 22 hours of in-seat hours per week. Um, and that includes your time learning OMM, your history and physical diagnosis, your procedures, uh, and as well as your longitudinal courses. So this is just a typical week just to give you some sense of it, but it varies from week to week. We do have in the SGL curriculum weekly quizzes and the way those are designed, and again, it's a very purposeful design, which was that we wanted students to make sure that they don't get behind in their work. We have quizzes on Friday mornings that's basically based on last the last week of content. So if it's a brand new block, that content will be based on the information from Monday to Wednesday. So students have a couple of nights to process. If it's a subsequent week in a block, then it'll be based on the Thursday through the Wednesday. So it's always five days. Students are given uh, 15 questions, multiple choice questions uh, to answer. They do those questions. They immediately see their answers and what they got right and what they got wrong. And they're sitting in groups of six to then discuss with their classmates and their assigned groups what questions they got right and what they got wrong to help teach one another. Because ultimately, when you are a resident, attendings aren't with you all day. When you're a resident, you're really there working quite independently uh, uh, with patient care. And so if you have questions, you're often asking other peers uh, to answer those questions in the moment to take care of patients. And so we really want to promote that idea of teamwork. We really want to promote that idea of asking questions and making yourself vulnerable to ask questions from your peers early on starting in first year. And so that's what those elimination quizzes are designed to do. On Monday and Wednesday afternoons, we alternate on the SGL side between case-based learning, which is small group work uh, around cases. Again, you're assigned with a physician to meet with them, to go over patient presentations and cases and work through uh, problem sets with chief complaints. Um, and then they rotate with community service learning and leadership and medical scholarship. So on a rotating basis, students will be in SGL in those three segments. Uh, and those always take place on Monday and Wednesday afternoons. Uh, Case-based learning also alternates with osteopathic uh, clinical skills procedures. Um, and so on the afternoons that we have case-based learning, students will often also have procedures those afternoons. For our problem-based learning, because that's more independent and self-driven, they have even fewer hours in seat. Um, they have roughly a nine hours, maybe a little bit less of uh, small group work where they're, again, they're working through cases and they probably work through a couple of cases a week in their small groups. Again, they're with uh, in first year, they're with basic scientists. In second year, they're with clinicians. And they're in groups of eight working through cases, teaching one another uh, through uh, learning issues that they take home. They also have procedures and they also have OMM and history and physical diagnosis. But again, they have their own track for that. They have community service learning, community service learning and leadership and medical scholarship uh, sort of sort of two weeks on, one week off because they don't have the case-based learning because they're already working in small groups by the nature of those tracks. Um, but when they come to CSLL and medical scholarship, they're coming together with their SGL colleagues. Um, so on average, they're probably closer uh, to uh, 12, 15 hours a week of in-seat time, including their OMM and their history and physical diagnosis. But that additional time is spent because they're doing a lot of self-teaching of learning their own learning issues that they come back and bring back to their small groups. So I hope that answers that question, because uh, I know that was a question that came up a couple of times of what a typical work week looks like. For a lot of students, when I tell them like, hey, you're only in seat for 20 hours or 22 hours a week, and they go, that's all? And I go, yeah, it's all the other studying that you're doing that makes you feel like the days are much longer. Uh, but our actual lecture time, we, we do try very hard to limit that time and really distill down to what's the most important critical stuff for you to know because we know how much time it takes to really practice and drill that information so that you can learn it, absorb it, and then apply it. One of the things that we're really proud of is our bridge weeks that we have. And our bridge weeks 
or really a desire to have not just summative high stakes exams, but really have places where we allow for breathing and exploration and excitement. I hope that all of you have sort of figured out why you want to be a doctor uh, and not just like to have a title and to earn money, but really in your heart, what resonates with you, what motivates you. Because when you're pulling these really, really long hours of studying 10, 12 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, uh, oftentimes, you really have to have a personal motivation. And we don't want to drill that out of you. We want to fan the flames of why you wanted to do medicine in the first place. So we have these bridge weeks, which stands for building, reflecting, integrating, developing, goal setting, and evaluation. Uh, say that three times fast. Uh, we have two in first year and then one at the end of second year and one at the end of third year, and they're super popular. Um, we integrate curricular content. We give some experiential learning, including some high fidelity simulations. And we also start talking about personal and professional development and giving some time for reflection during these times. Students are applying for residencies uh, at the end of their third year, beginning of their fourth year of medical school. But we start talking about the residency application process in your first year. We start talking about that uh, at the end of the fall semester of first year so that we can make sure that you're really thinking about who do I want to be when I grow up? Like, what do I have to have so I have a great application and I'm super competitive for whatever I'm thinking about going into? And even if you change your mind along the way, which many, many, many people do, at least you will have had those research experiences or those mission experiences or those international experiences or whatever other experiences or le those leadership experiences. All of those skills are transferable independent of the specialty that you go into. And we really wanna have you maximize your time in medical school as you're doing those things. And we think Bridge Weeks really help our students to do that. So here are some of the things that take place during those Bridge Weeks we have high fidelity simulation. We go through some more time with procedures. POCUS is not hocus pocus. It's a, a point of care ultrasound, which again starts in your first year of medical school. Point of care ultrasound is super, super common in medicine now. Uh, it was when I was in training, which was not that long ago. Ultrasound was really used by cardiologists and OB-GYNs. OB-GYNs look at bellies and cardiologists to look at hearts through uh, echoes. And now it's used constantly at the bedside. It's used in the ER as a, a quick way to see if you have an acute abdomen. It's used by anyone doing musculoskeletal medicine to do any kind of injections for, for joints is done with ultrasound. It's used at the hospital bedside for putting in uh, um, uh, IV central lines. Uh, it's constant. Uh, and there's only uh, a couple dozen medical schools that teach uh, point of care ultrasound at the medical school level and even fewer that started in first year. So we're really proud uh, to have that happen. Uh, and one of the additional places, including beginning in the fall semester that we do that is during our bridge weeks. We also have some really fun interactive games around medicine and problem solving called ISSAs uh, and some round robins uh, with our OIER, which is an integrated exam review. We also do some teaching uh, OSCEs, uh, which are objective uh, uh, standardized clinical skills experiences and some national exams to have students practice and get ready for those uh, before boards. We really start career advisement uh, in the fall of our first year in our first bridge weeks. And we really start coaching and talking about competencies and how you think as a professional so that you're really residency ready. Some of the sessions that we've had in our Bridge Weeks have include sessions on implicit bias, imposter syndrome, giving feedback from upperclassmen, talking about careers in medicine and choosing a specialty, developing your CV, and really understanding research and scholarship as part of your long-term goals. Again, uh, we have some really fun opportunities for students to practice a lot of the things that they're doing. And this is just some of the comments that we've had from our third years about their experience in Bridge Weeks and with our procedures. We have a fantastic new sim lab and an amazing medical director, Dr. Brolis, who oversees that, uh, doing task trainers and procedures uh, that the students really enjoy. 
uh, we have students working in teams in simulation environments. Uh, there's Alan Eckert running that from behind the scenes with our talking mannequins, and he can make that mannequin do anything he wants with its vitals and having our students work uh, through cases that are real life. Those rooms look like our hospital rooms. They're set up just like our hospital bedrooms uh, to get used to that environment uh, in a protected space before you're out seeing patients. One of the things that we have in our bridge week is our cardiac escape room. Again, students working in teams uh, to work through a case and an environment uh, and really practicing some of the things that they've already learned in the fall semester. Behind the scenes, one of the things that we have is an incredible assessment team. Uh, and they take all the information that we funnel in from curriculum to really track students on a very intimate level across all of our competencies to see how they're doing. And we expose students uh, to their own dashboard behind the scenes starting in the fall of their first year. And that carries through so that students can really appreciate how they're doing and all of the investment that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that you're gonna be great physicians and you're gonna feel confident about your abilities as you move forward. So everything that we do along the way is really designed to help support students in their learning and make sure that they're on track to be great physicians, that you are constantly reflecting along the way to make sure that you are participating in activities uh, and opportunities that really help you to become the person that you wanna be and the physician that you wanna be so that you can bring those back to the communities that you want to serve. So with that, I think I've answered most of the questions that have come through. One of the other questions that came through was about boards and how we fared in boards with the new curriculum. I have to say, unfortunately, nationally, across all medical schools, uh, we've seen a, a slight decline in pass rates. Uh, nationally, I think COVID has hit all medical students across the nation hard. Uh, I'm afraid we were not uh, an exception to that rule, uh, and we have followed those trends a little bit. Uh, but we are still in over well over 90 percent pass rate uh, in boards and consistent with what the national pass rates are. Um, but I think that's really a reflection nationally of how uh, students have done uh, with COVID and having their education interrupted at that time. Um, I see a question in the chat. It says, how is anatomy lab diff offered in PBL track and how is it different in PBL versus SGL? So PBL, uh, you know, it's funny, we talk about PB on SGL as if it's a sort of absolute difference. Um, and it's more of a predominance. So PBL is predominantly self-taught in terms of working in small groups and, and doing learning issues. But then they come across with our intercessions and our bridge weeks and our um, medical scholarship and CSLL. And so there's some lecture component to it. And SGL is, has a large uh, component of lectures to it, but then we come together in case-based learning and we come together in IQs and we, and we do a lot of uh, working together through groups in that respect. So it's really what's more dominant style. It's not an absolute one or the other. For PBL, PBL will often have invite lectures in, <laughs> often from the SGL side to come in and give them sort of directed lectures on, on a couple of topics um, and sometimes lead directed sessions on a couple of topics and anatomy is one of those so they'll usually have dr carcia come and walk them through a cadaver a cadaveric lab or some prosections uh, prosections are basically uh expertly dissected sections that are then uh preserved uh to do demonstrations on for students um and he'll walk them through those in our Sewell campus, we have an anatomatage table, which is this incredible, incredible table. You can look it up on Google if you want to, that can really sort of take through imaging, take you through the body uh, in multiple directions uh, and cuts to see the anatomy. Uh, and that's available uh, uh, or located on the Sewell, Sewell campus and will be available to any student in either track, but it's gonna be located on the Sewell campus. On the Stratford campus, PBL students still, uh, uh, actually, all students have, still have access to the cadaveric lab through their sessions with Dr. Garcia, but those are the two ways that anatomy is uh, addressed on the PBL side. So thank you for that question. And Dr. Chanel, I just got another one. It's can you re-explain the term double pass and circular pass in regards to SGL? Sure. So, you know, originally we said single pass, but that really, for SGL, that really isn't accurate. Um, so if you look at most medical schools, and let's just take the PBL part of it out for just a second, just for simplicity. 
um, you have, again, for simplicity, two years of pre-clerkship content and two years of clerkship content. Just for simplicity, some schools have 18 months, 20 months, et cetera, but two and two. In the first two years in pre-clerkship is when you're learning the basic and clinical science. So basic sciences are things like anatomy, physiology, uh, biochemistry, how do things work when they're working correctly? And clinical sciences are about sort of disease processes and when things break down and then how do you diagnose and treat them? So that includes the clinical medicine piece, pharmacology, pathology, uh, and clinical skills interventions. Um, most schools, work on a systems format, meaning um, they will work through the cardiology or cardiac system, the pulmonology system, the renal system, and you'll be learning all of those basic and clinical sciences as it relates to those systems at a time. So when you're in renal, if you're in a system that does basic sciences and then clinical sciences, the first year, all of your systems will be around the basic sciences, histology, physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, and you'll be learning that, but still in around the system of cardiology, pulmonology, renal, GI. That's how you'll learn and go through those subject matters through those systems. And then the second year, the double pass, is you'll go through those systems again, but now be focused on pathology, uh, uh, pharmacology, clinical medicine, diagnosis and treatment as you go through. So that's what makes it a double pass. The first time you go through the systems, it's just talking about normal anatomy, normal physiology, normal biochemistry. And the second time you go through, you're talking about the clinical components uh, through the systems again, but then focused on the pharmacology, the pathology and the clinical medicine. So that would be a double pass because they're discrete. When we talk about a circular pass, for our blocks, we integrate in the SGL curriculum, both the basic sciences and the clinical sciences. So when our students are in cardiology, they are learning the normal anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry of the heart. And then they move directly into, in the same time period, into the pathology when the heart isn't functioning the way it's supposed to. What does that look like from a pathology standpoint? How do we diagnose that? How do we treat that? What's the pathology associated with it? The reason that we've really started referring to it as a circular pass is because, yes, we talk about cardiology in the spring of first year, um, but you learn the anatomy in anatomy in the fall of first year. And then you revisit that anatomy again when you do the cardiology. And then when you come back in the fall and you're doing hematology, pulmonology, uh, and nephrology, HPN, you have to refer back <laughs> to the anatomy and you have to refer back to the cardiac physiology and diagnosis because we're whole people. Uh, and so that's the part that becomes spherical or, or circular is that you repass and, and revisit those concepts just because the, the body's integrated and there's no way to do that in these discrete things as if one thing doesn't affect the other. And the sequence of the blocks that we've developed uh, for the circular pass is based on that knowledge of things building on one another and what's the order that things should come in. So uh, I hope that answers that question. If it doesn't, I'm happy to answer to clarify if I, if I haven't been clear. So in PBL, their first year is on a double pass system where basic sciences in the first year and clinical sciences in the second year, but obviously there's no absolute discrete, it's just a focus. And in the SGL curriculum, it's more circular as they constantly wind their way through the basic and clinical sciences. Thanks, Dr. Chagall. And I just got another question. How do lectures differ between SGL and PBL pathways? So PBL doesn't have lectures except for the common courses. Um, what happens is we have a wonderful platform that we got last year, uh, a DXR platform for clinicians. And the students in PBL are presented with a, a patient with a chief complaint uh, and a presentation, and they have to develop questions to sort of solve the problem. How do they come up with a diagnosis? They decide on what are called learning issues and put those together. They go home and research those things, and they come back, and part of their next session is going through those learning issues before they move on to the next part of the next case, uh, or the next part of that case, or the next case that's, that's up uh, in the sequence. For STL, it's more structured in that the 
sequence of the clinical and basic sciences is determined centrally, uh, and we bring in lecturers to walk students through that content. So to answer the question, except for when they are in common courses, PBL doesn't have lectures. Uh, they may episodically invite in a lecturer on a particular topic, but generally speaking, the overwhelming bulk of the, the system blocks for PBL is group learning and group directed versus SGL, which is lecture based. I'm not sure if I answered the question. I definitely think that answered it. Let me see. Any questions? Oh. When applying to residencies, can the places we apply to see which track we chose? They can see which track you chose in so much as that they're looking at your transcript and if somebody's familiar with uh, the way that we name things, they, they might be familiar with that. The truth is, the part of the reason that we went to pass fail in the pre clerkship curriculum is that residencies just don't care. Uh, and that, that's coming from talking to residency directors. We didn't just make that up. Uh, this is from attending conferences, attending work groups, uh, reading the literature uh, and, and academic medicine, and talking to our own residency directors. Uh, and the truth of the matter is they want to know that you've passed your boards, which is also why Comlex Level 1 and Step Level 1 have gone past bail, because you need that knowledge uh, in order to take care of patients, but that knowledge is less predictive of how you're going to function clinically than Level 2 and Step 2. Uh, and so, yes, they can see that if they're familiar. I'm not sure that our transcript says PBL track, but the names of the courses are slightly different, uh, and so they'll have some sense of that. But the, the truth of the matter is that, that largely residencies are, are not particularly concerned. They want to know that you're competent. And then we got another question. Could you talk a little bit about how group work is still incorporated into SGL? Sure. There's a few ways that we do that. So, and actually we had to really be quite deliberate because some students and when we the first year said there's too many different individual groups so we try to max out on about four groups four different groups across the different places that you do group work the first is in uh, for SGL in your illumination quiz groups those are set groups uh, with six students and you're with that group week to week for the year so hopefully that you'll develop a great relationship with them and feel comfortable uh, sharing information and moving back and forth. And so that happens every Friday morning. The second is in case-based learning, which again starts in November, November, December, early December, in our rheumatology, dermatology system block, which is the first system block. And students are in a group uh, of eight students and one clinician, uh, again, for the year. And they work with that clinician to work through clinical cases. And we don't allow students to switch groups. You are allowed one excused absence a year uh, from those sessions. And the reason that we do that is so that you can develop a dynamic with that group and you can develop a relationship with that clinician. And for a lot of students, you know, medical school can feel very big and very broad. And we really want to make intimate spaces where you can develop relationships and get a rhythm and get uh, uh, a sense of another person that you can maybe ask for a lot of a recommendation for or give you directions uh, if they happen to be in a specialty that you're interested in, uh, but who can really get to know you and see what your process is longitudinally in a discussion based format. In our longitudinal courses and community service learning and leadership, you work in small groups for some group work projects that you have to do, as well as in medical scholarship, you work in small groups. And again, those are assigned for the year. Uh, and in your breakout groups for clinical skills for OMM and HMP and procedures, um, your procedures groups correspond to your case-based learning groups. So let's say, for example, case-based learning, your group might meet on Mondays from 1 to 3 p.m. and you're in case-based learning. From 3 to 5 p.m., you would go over to the sim lab to do your procedures. You're with the same group when you go over to that lab, so you're still working uh, in the same team. Uh, and then your OMM and HMP groups uh, tend to be the same as, as you're working uh, in the labs. So we really try and create intimate uh, relationships that you can 
get to know groups uh, uh, in a smaller venue uh, on a longitudinal basis. Thanks, Josh. We got another one. Is one track more focused for primary care internal medicine than medicine than the other? Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are dedicated to primary care, and I, I heard. Uh, one of our former leaders, uh, who I admire very much, and she was a DO, Dr. Boyd, and she worked in, she taught and was a leader in both allopathic and osteopathic schools. And what she said to me really resonated. She said, you know, if you look at an MD and a DO primary care doc, you really won't see much difference in terms of philosophy and approach. Where you see the difference is in the MD cardiologist and the DO cardiologist, and that the DO cardiologist really tends to focus and think more like a primary care doc uh, in terms of how they think holistically and they approach the cardiac system from that perspective. And that's really what we're hoping for. We're hoping to make great primary care docs, but we're hoping that even if you move into a specialty, whether it's internal medicine or surgery, that you still bring that that philosophy of holistic care, that philosophy of understanding the challenges that this patient is gonna face when they walk out of the hospital or they walk out of your surgical suite or they walk out of your office, that you still bring that to bear in your care. And so we integrate that on both sides um, because again, whatever track you choose, the track you choose is based on your learning style. The school you choose is based on your philosophy and our philosophy is the same for both tracks. I'm just keeping an eye out for any other questions. Any other questions, y'all? I'm keeping, I'm taking a look at the Q&A and the chat. I don't see anything new in the chat. So while you're looking, I'll just make the comment, you know, we really want people to keep their excitement level up. Like I said, it doesn't matter where you go to medical school. You're in for some work. <laughs> uh, you're going to be pushed uh, in a way that you probably haven't been pushed before. Uh, it doesn't matter where you go. The question is, do you feel like emotionally it's a safe space? Do you feel like people here are rooting for you uh, and, and, and pushing you up? Or are they looking down on you and saying, you know, good luck and it's on you whether you get through or not? Uh, and I can promise you that we are tr constantly trying to cultivate a place where you can find connection and you can feel like, yes, this is hard, but it's worth it. And, and my school is rooting for me. My school is really trying to create a space that will make me successful uh, and is gonna challenge me on a personal level to be my best self, which is not always comfortable. Growth is not always comfortable. If you've ever you know, worked to learn how to play a musical instrument or be better at a sport or lose weight or do anything along, that it's not easy uh, and you wanna have accountability. And so we work to do that, but we work to do it in a way that always conveys um, the love and support that we want you to have through this process. Because we want you to convey that to your patients when you're done. If when you're struggling, you were treated with compassion and empathy and support and clarity, hopefully you can also role model that for your patients and your community and the people who train under you uh, ultimately. And so, you know, when you're a parent, you parent often the way you were parented. Uh, we don't want you to have to unlearn <laughs> how you learned in order to teach your patients. We want you to carry that role modeling that you saw as a medical student into your residencies and into your practices. And so that's really what we're going for. Uh, so uh, I think I just saw a question pop up, but it disappeared really quick. Um, well, it's timely. It's what we were talking about to begin. When do you need to commit to a track? Is there a deadline? And thank you for the informative session. You're welcome uh, for the informative session. You're welcome for the informative session. Um, so I, Paula and John, you'll correct me. Uh, it, this group has all been admitted. So again, congratulations. Um, March 9th is the deadline if you've already been admitted and you haven't already applied and you're interested in applying for uh, PBL, we ask you to submit that by March 9th. And then by March 14th, the admissions office is going to be sending out letters confirming your track. Uh, and, and that's where you'll be. Now, if after that you decide you want to apply, uh, you would make that application known, but there is no guarantee to that track at that point. And so uh, you may be waitlisted for a track if you decide 
um, that you want to uh, switch over. So March 9th uh, is the last official date and letters will go out March 14th. Uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for giving us your time this morning we, uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, other questions, John, anything coming through? Not that I'm seeing. And the only thing I'll piggyback is piggyback with is we'll definitely get an email out to everybody on Monday too. So don't feel like you have to jump on anything right now. We're going to send out some communication to you um, and we'll give you next steps from there as well. I don't, I muted myself. Let me check and see if there's anything in the Q and A. Uh, a question is how do we confirm our track? We're going to get that over to you. Uh, how do you apply for PBL? Do you want me to take that since I handle the PBL app? Sure, yes. please. I can answer one. Look at me. Um, the PBL application process, there's an essay that we'll send to you. So what you would do is you would complete that, you'd get it back to us, and then it'll be reviewed by the committee. Um, and we'll let you know what the determination is following that. And the, the emails that we'll send out to will have the link to the PBL application. So you'll be able to see the prompts in there. Yeah, I think we kind of covered everything. I don't see any new questions. Dean Watkins, do you want to sign off? So let me just make sure. I, I think I covered a typical week. Um, that was asked a few times. I think I talked about anatomy. Um, medical scholarship, um, I just want to make a comment. I don't know if I covered that enough. Um, we really expect that research and experience in medical scholarship is going to become increasingly important with complex going past fail and again <clears throat> that is based on conversations that we have on the national level going to conferences meeting with residency directors hearing panels and feedback from residency directors who themselves quite frankly have not all quite figured it out uh, but that is the feedback uh, and so we have really been working on making sure Listen, we have some students who have done research full time and they have done research stem to stern and they have published papers. And then we have people who maybe have only done a summer research experience for undergraduates, which is great. I mean, I did those uh, when I was an undergrad, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to form a formulate a clinical question. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know how what the IRB process is like or city or HIPAA training is like. It doesn't mean that you know how to properly cite and do a literature review or write a method section or do those components. And so we are really trying to make sure that all of our students have that as a baseline question. Do they know how to formulate a question? Do they know, which seems like obvious, it's not. Um, do they know how to do a proper literature review, which is the background information that you'd have to do for any paper that you would ever do? Have you been through IRB, uh, applications, which is a big bear for any researcher. Um, have you been through city and HIPAA training? Why? One, we think it's important, you know, when you practice medicine, you do evidence-based practice, which is using the evidence in the literature to decide how you're going to treat patients. On an ongoing basis, medicine is constantly changing and you will have to look up journal articles directly, not in a textbook, but in the journal that day. Textbooks are five years behind. In a journal that came out that month, that year, what applies to your patient in real time? And so when you're reading it, how do you know if it's a good article? Just because it was published doesn't mean it was actually valid, doesn't mean that you actually have to agree with it because someone published it. Uh, and that's why medicine changes, right? New information becomes available. And sometimes you see articles refuted or retracted. Uh, that doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. So how do you know how to discern when you read an article? And that's part of what we take you through through medical scholarship. And then everyone has to write a capstone project. And we hope that that will promote, and we've seen a, a big influx of students who are actually publishing because we have that infrastructure to help students do that, uh, and having abstracts and having posters and things, again, products that they can put on their CV when they're applying that will make them more competitive when they apply. Uh, a bit of foreshadowing, when you go to residency, all ACGME residencies require scholarly work as a graduation requirement. It doesn't matter if you're family practice, surgery, dermatology, orthopedics, cardiology, it doesn't matter. All residency programs require uh, some sort of scholarly work. And so we wanna make sure that you have fundamental skills so that you can hit the ground and be ready when it's time for you to do that for residency so that you can get out of residency and move very fluidly through that process. 
you're also having to do that while you're on your rotations and seeing patients and working 60 hours or what is it, 80 hours a week is the cap now working 80 hours a week as a residence you also have to do your scholarly work on the side how do you balance that? Well, we start teaching you how to balance that uh, in medical school. It's a balancing act. It's not something that you're always given designated and protected time for in residency. Certainly you're not always given protected time for it as an attending physician. How do you start to balance that out? We start to train you uh, in that process, which is not always easy um, in medical school of how to do that, to ramp you up towards that process uh, and that end goal. So I wanted to make sure that I hit that question. Um, I do see the question, and I mentioned this before, but in choosing PBL versus SGL, it's really a learning style. Um, you know, some students really like to work quite independently. They're going to read a thousand books anyway. They're going to read, you know, all these pieces of information anyway. And so they want to be set free from the constraints of as much lecture time because they're going to spend their time doing that independent research anyway. And so they want to be in those environments. They want to be constantly talking in collaborative uh, or listening in on ideas uh, from other sources. And they like the intimacy of PBL. Other students like more structure and they're like, okay, I don't want to be in a seat for 40 hours a week, but I can do your 22 hours at Chanel. <laughs> um, but I'd rather be able to walk through and know. And, you know, I like talk talking to people. I'm going to be a doctor. I like talking to people, but maybe I don't want to do as much of that. And so it's really about those learning styles. If you haven't shadowed, I encourage you to shadow uh, if you're on the fence of that uh, or talk to students in the, in the different tracks to see what they liked uh, and, and what they thought could have been stronger. Uh, in their experience. Uh, but PBL is an exciting track. Um, and often for the first few months, SGL students catch up, but the first few months of the clerkships, PBL often have a little bit of a leg up in so much as they're used to that independent style. And so by the time they get the clerkships, they hit the ground running. The SGL students sort of catch up after a couple of months, but there is that difference in that independence uh, and promoting that independence on the PBL side. So it's really just about your learning style and your preferences. Uh, but again, it doesn't matter what track you choose. SOM is always here for you. Um, so I hope that if some people are still thinking about that, that they'll, they'll look at that. Um, let's see. I think that covers uh, all the things. Um, and I didn't have any other questions here that I mean, the same question came up a few times, um, but I think I hit all of them. Sean, anything else coming up for you on that side? The only thing I can think of is we have a continuation of this series through the next couple of weeks, and we're covering a lot of different topics. We're covering, there will be a PBL session specifically in the coming weeks. We're working with Dr. Scally to put that together. Um, we have one on rotations, which I know is a really important issue. Uh, well, issue, exciting issue, I should say. Um, we have a session with our CTL department who does our pre program, and they'll talk about advising and accommodations um, and a lot of different ways that we academically support our students. We have a student, uh, student services one as well. Well, you're here about clubs and organizations and different research opportunities. There's a full series here um, that we'll continue to promote throughout the semester. So we really hope to see you all throughout the semester as part of it. It's really comprehensive. It's the first time I think we've done this virtually in a little while. So we're really excited to see how this goes. Did I miss anything, Dean Watkins? No, I think you covered it. Um, I think that uh, this is a really great session. And thank everyone for participating. It's been really great. Dr. Chanel, thank you so much for such an informative session. Um, hopefully it's been really helpful to the students. I know I was taking notes as well, uh, making certain that, you know, we're providing as much information to our students as possible. And I would only um, ask our, you know, our students to feel comfortable asking the admissions team any questions um, that you can think of. It's our goal and our job to ensure that you have a really great experience as you begin your medical school education. And so we're here for you. Can't wait to see you again and talk to you, um, you know, on some of the upcoming sessions. And John, thank you so much for putting this together. It's really great. There is a question that came through, was Prematric virtual or in person this year? I have to come back and verify that last year. Um, uh, it was hybrid and I expect that it will be hybrid uh, again. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Chanel. No problem. So that means partially in person, partially uh, virtually. Excellent. John, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we covered everything then, y'all. Let me say thank you all so much for being here. Please get outside. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful day. Um, 
Take care of yourselves. We'll see you all really soon. And thank you for being here. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chanel.